So is uh, Herschel headed to south now? I don't see his name for him. Have you resigned? <clears throat> I didn't. I don't remember hearing him have resignation letter when he uh, when they were in the house. <laughs> they could be. I don't know. They are. Just I don't know if they spin. Tip them all over. Tip them all over. Spin the. It's not usually spin. So my, I have said, I think it's right now. It's not fine. That's all right. I had the other team. Is that a problem? Once you're right to the bottom, so it's higher, but you can't get it. There we go. Technology. I'm going to open up the final meeting of the committee on ways and means, and we have to discuss what we want to do with five interim study bills. Interim study bills at House Bill 504, 1204, 1500, 1525, and 1565. We can make one or two choices. After we listen to discussion, we can either vote uh, to consider for future legislation or recommend future legislation or not recommend. Those are only, only two choices. So we're going to start off with House Bill 504, which is the has to do with education funding. Representative Ames. Thank you. Is that on? Yeah, it is. Um, so yes, we're we're here to um, decide what to do with what recommendation to put forward on House Bill 504, um, and I th I handed out, I uh, took around two pieces of uh, two two items. One is a document that you've seen before when we uh, um, decided to go as a committee to go into interim study. This was uh, a document that I'd put together to uh, um, identify what was in the bill. And then uh, the second piece of uh, the sec second article uh, is, uh, is just two pages. It's an excerpt only from a complaint that was filed, I think it was late this summer, uh, called RAND v, v. the State of New Hampshire. And I'll say a few words about that in a moment. But what I wanted to, to say, and this is all very brief because uh, 
we're in a sort of a different mode here, um, is that uh, the core elements of this bill are, um, are what I want to focus on. <clears throat> uh, and the first is uh, relates to what it, it is not and uh, what it does not do. <clears throat> it, it, it does not do away with SWEPT. It leaves the tax in place. That's uh, one fundamental point. Um, the tax rate is unaffected by this bill. Whatever the tax rate may be is a product of how much money um, the state determines should be raised by the tax. And uh, currently, in this year, it's about $263 million. Uh, starting fiscal year, the next fiscal year, it will be $363 million. And then the rate uh, that uh, is needed to produce that amount of money is determined by DRA. Um, for my community, it plays out to a dollar and eighty-seven cents this year. Uh, it differs from community to community because of the process of equalization of uh, assessed values. Um, so it does not uh, do away with SWEPT, but it does respond to a constitutional challenge that uh, many people are fearful will be brought. It has been brought in this complaint, in fact, and I will uh, go to that in a sec. But uh, <coughs> the, uh, the bill itself requires that all revenues produced by this tax uh, are sent forward by the collecting agencies, the municipalities, to the state for deposit in the education fund except for a, an amount that may be retained by the municipalities to cover essentially the costs of collection and to encourage outreach to uh, make the uh, rebate program for, uh, for t poor taxpayer, taxpayers that have limited resources uh, more effective. Uh, so uh, it has uh, both that element of all revenues go to the state and then the second element allowing for retention of uh, a small amount to uh, cover costs of collection and uh, as an incentive for the rebate program and then thirdly most of, of central importance it greatly enlarges the uh, low and moderate income homeowners income uh, property tax relief program um, it, uh, it, the most significant aspect of what's in this bill is that it extends the rebate to the school tax as well as to the statewide property tax. Once it does that, that's a, a big jump in what the relief will amount to. In my community, uh, the uh, school rate is about, a, about $12 per thousand <clears throat> and uh, you add that to that the state property tax rate 1.73 and you apply that to what in this bill will become the uh, the top uh, assessed value that can be uh, subject to the re relief which in this bill is two hundred and twenty thousand dollars and you get a fair amount of money um, the bill caps what can be rebated at one thousand dollars right now and it also caps the total amount that can be rebated across the state at $25 million. Um, both of those figures, of course, could be adjusted in future legislation. Um, and finally, uh, and this is the other last of the core elements of this bill that I wanted to highlight, it sets up a study uh, to explore ways of extending the taxpayer relief to tenants, to renters, uh, as it stands right now, it's for homeowners, and we all know that tenants, uh, through their rent, are paying sig significantly, making significant payments as a result of high property taxes. Um, and so back to uh, this handout, the complaint, uh, this was filed this summer. It relates to the larger issue of, of fairness in school funding. Um, and it's, uh, I'll refer to it as the Rand case, Rand v. State of New Hampshire. Uh, if you look on the uh, 
second page, which is really the ninth page of the complaint, uh, there is a section five uh, headline, the current education property tax system is unconstitutional. And it goes through, I'm not gonna go through the details of it, but basically it's that there's a rebate, essentially uh, the current tax is allowed to set uh, as collected in the community in which it's collected, regardless of what the uh, adequacy education uh, costs may be. And for many, I won't say many, for a significant number of property wealthy towns, that means that they keep more than they need for adequacy. And uh, it's that aspect of uh, disproportionate uh, retention that uh, triggers the constitutional concerns, which to this committee were raised in the first instance by William, William Ardinger, uh, a uh, expert in tax matters that, who's well known. Um, and uh, he uh, submitted a letter which should be in the record of this, uh, this legislation um, stating in forceful terms his opinion that this uh, tax, because of this disproportional aspect of uh, retention, is uh, unconstitutional. Uh, so uh, this uh, House Bill 504 seeks to correct that. So I think uh, what I want to say and sum up is that uh, this is a matter that I think indisputably requires further legislation. Exactly what that legislation would be uh, would be to be determined. It's not uh, the purpose of uh, an interim study to uh, come down hard on one side or another of what will be done, but um, but uh, these, this question of constitutionality needs to be addressed. The sufficiency of the taxpayer relief program and the opportunity that SWEP presents for a, a broader tax relief program applying to all the property taxpayers, regardless of whether it's, uh, it's the state tax or the uh, municipal or school tax, uh, local school tax. Um, uh, this kind of relief is desperately needed. We all know that. Um, and uh, future legislation can address this in a way that seems uh, most suitable to whoever files. I expect that I would file if I'm reelected, of course, um, and uh, seek something similar to what you have in front of you, but it might not be exactly the same. So I hope that uh, for all of these reasons, um, that we can agree that uh, further legislation is needed on this subject and uh, go forward with that. Thank you. Thank you for your comprehensive analysis of this legislation, Representative Ames. And you bring up a point that I've always agreed on, is the statewide education property tax should have been delivered directly to the state and not retained locally. And then it would do what it was supposed to do. Okay. Further questions or comments? Representative Yearly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm directed to Representative Ames. Um, I was generally under the impression that the equitable and proportional section of tax law applied to the application of the tax, not the distribution of the tax. Just for my own edification, could you address that a little bit? Representative Ames. Yeah. Um, not sure I can do that distinction that way, but the, uh, the um, tax as it's applied and in truth is every, every taxpayer is going to pay a dollar and something. Um, used to be $2 and something, but because of inflation and property values, it's gone down. It's the constant uh, amount to be collected has stayed the same. Um, and then um, the, uh, I believe there's some Supreme Court language also to this effect that um, if the collected amount is then turned back into the community, so into one community, but not all, in a disproportionate way. 
so that in fact the taxpayers in that community that get back some of the state money that's been collected because that's what it is is state money it's not the locality's money if it comes back to effectively reduce the rate that the property taxpayer is paying and you know you and i can go back and forth on application versus rebate or whatever and uh so what you know it's the court ultimately that will figure this out and uh i think everybody including such an expert as mr ardinger backs off in terms of absolutes and recognizes that uh you know the final call is going to be by the group of judges who hear the case thank Follow you up, Representative Early. And yes I, I think you're correct on that and uh uh, because what it'll do is provide us, if this case goes forward and if it rules the way that it looks like it probably should rule, it would give both this committee, the, the its uh, sister committee in the in the Senate, and DRA guidance regarding both the taking of the tax and the distribution of the tax, and take that equitable and proportional phraseology and apply it to both, which I think is an important. Uh, thing that in today's society needs to be done. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and I agree with that. Uh, we often agree, don't we? <laughs> Representative Romney. Yeah, I, I got a question, a question for uh, Representative Ames. Uh, what's your sense in terms of the speed of this case? <laughs> I guess they have to, I know things don't move very quickly. Yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to get a sense of you know, I guess some of the judgments of the of the of the court are going to be taken into consideration, in our work. I, I'm not. I have no objection to, to moving this forward as a yes, for future legislation, because I think there's components, as Representative Major said, that are, I think, I think we can all agree on. I mean, some of the details in this current bill we may not agree on, but I think there's some things that we can, we can come together mm -hmm. on. So. Any sense if the case is going to give this a priority or not, or I mean, you may not know. <laughs> yeah, I think that it's, a, it's, it's the question we all ask and wonder about. And uh, there is a second school funding case, as you know, uh, that began with the Conville, Conville School District complaining about the inadequacy of the adequacy uh, grants that they are receiving and. Uh, and that was filed, what, a couple of years ago, I'm guessing. Uh, and uh, life goes on, and uh, and they're still in discovery. And uh, now the second case has come along, and uh, whether that will slow things down or speed things up, I don't know. Um, I think it's going to be... Uh, I don't even want to venture a guess, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, it's going to be a while. I, I kind of thought that would be the answer, but I just <laughs> couldn't resist asking the question. Thank you. Further questions or comments? I'm Representative Alney. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to provide a little bit of um, bill court history on this, on um, which you know, uh, that the we spent a number of years after the first on education funding task force that we were both on on the legislature did um trying to make the system that we'd been stuck with work and on uh, in i think around 09 08 um we changed the formula and the and the procedures and the supreme court for the first time agreed that we had done enough and that they were removing the strict scrutiny that they'd put on us on a few years later in i think 11 uh that was changed mostly from the initiative of the Senate to um, undo a number of those things. One of them was to make the amount in the statewide property tax 363 million forever. Um, and the other 
was to uh, allow the uh, donor communities, as they were called and are still calling themselves sometimes, on to retain the excess property tax that was raised by this fairly small amount. By the way, when we started, it was six thousand dollars, six hundred, six hundred, oh, dollars and sixty cents per thousand, uh, and it rapidly went down to I think four, uh, something like that, and then decreased again in in eleven, um, and so. The only way, because they dismissed scru st strict scrutiny, the only way that, that this could be challenged again was to start from something like this and something like Conval and go back through the courts. And the courts can uh, delay things as they will, depending on when they're politically sensitive. Uh, <laughs> and uh, have done so, I think, in the Conval case. Um, but um, it was in 1996, December, I believe, after the election that we were uh, told by the Supreme Court that we had to solve this now. <laughs> and, and um, or maybe it was, 98? 98. 98, yes. So um, we came in as second termers, first time on the Finance Committee, and they had to put together a task force. And Speaker Cytek, uh did a very brave thing and uh, opened up at that point in late December. She opened up the bill filings to allow anybody to put in anything that they thought would uh, provide a uh, sufficient amount of money to fund this. We had a $1 billion a year budget at that point for the general fund. There was no education trust fund. And uh, when we finished scraping away at anything that might possibly not be relevant, we were at 800 million that we had to add to the state budget. So that gives you an idea of the huge jump that the courts required and that the legislature decided it had to react to. And I'm telling you all this because nobody tried to file and go through the long case until a few years ago and we may find ourselves this December uh, faced with the same conundrum, whoever is in charge, whoever, however many of us are back. And um, it's, it's going to be interesting and we will need vehicles. And so I definitely support this because it's, it's a vehicle that can be used by whoever is trying to deal with the court requirements. Just to add a little bit of history to this, in 1998, uh, when Representative Alamy and I were in our second term, we were both on finance. And at that time, finance and ways and means was together. And there was normally three divisions as there is now. And the speaker, form a fourth division, which Representative Almy and I were put on to solve the education funding thing. And we worked every day, Sundays, et cetera, for a long time, and we came up with this. Six, six weeks, six and a half days a week. Yep. He gave us Sunday morning off. Uh, I've nope. got a bad back. Well, we got it done, and it still works today, but it needs to be tweaked. Um, any other comments? Representative Spelsbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, I also support having legislation on this tangled subject before the committee during the coming term. Uh, 
one thing that I wonder though, in the complaint on page nine, that second page, paragraph uh, 29 says, it says of the action that this legislature took last year to reduce the swept collections by 100 million. It says this temporarily eliminated the surplus swept revenues that property wealthy towns have previously failed to send to the state and instead have kept for themselves. So I think it's an interesting thing to note. While that doesn't address all that this bill is concerned with, an incidental effect, you could say benefit, of the $100 million reduction was that it effectively um, suspended the retention of excess revenue. I may just Representative Ames. Just to note that it, that change was accompanied with a grant to the property wealthy communities that was fashioned as a hold harmless that essentially made up for what they could no longer retain. So Further questions or comments on House Bill 504? Send none. Uh, Representative Ames? Representative Brown. So I guess we're all, we're all, the sense is that we're, we're, we're probably going to move forward with something. So what's the plan? I mean, this is a big topic. I mean, is it going to be a handful of people getting in a room coming up with a bill? Or do we <laughs> Uh, I guess you can file a bill. I mean, I, you know, I'm big on commissions, and we probably had a million commissions on this. If I don't know how many commissions we've had on this topic over the years. I don't know either. The most uh, recent one, which was, as you know, state funding commission. Um, I'll start over. I I don't know uh, how many there have been. In my time, uh, most recently, and I sat on this one, was uh, the Commission on School Funding uh, that ended its work in late 2020. Before that, there was one that uh, Representative Umberger chaired. Uh, there was a committee, not a commission. Um, and uh, that uh, did its work uh, one or two years before the maybe one or one year before the startup of the commission that I just spoke of. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in uh, 2009 or, or eight, probably eight, um, there was a, uh, a, a committee that did uh, groundbreaking work on this, uh, this effort. Um, and uh, that was a, a uh, that was a legislative committee as well, a joint committee. Um, and uh, it's the product of their work that carried forward through the years in the form of a sta stabilization grant after much of the language of, the, uh, of, uh, of their changes had been cleaned out. Um, uh, there was this consensus that, uh, that the funding needed to be carried forward, and so a stabilization grant was devised that essentially did that. Uh, with a, um, a shrinking aspect to it, 4% per year, but then that in recent years was taken away. So it's, it's, a, it's a mishmash of uh, things that we've got here that are the product of, of, uh, of joint work, you're right about that, and uh, people getting together and trying to figure out what to do in a, in a, on a matter that seems to defy solution. Um, how we how we proceed with this, and I think the traditional way is that uh, legislators go back at this stage in the you know in the year, go back and uh, someone comes forward with a bill that may be the product of uh, behind the scenes uh, work with others, or it may not be. Um, I don't I don't know what to suggest here. I I will go back. I glad to confer with uh, whoever wants to confer with me. Um, in an informal process. Representative Browning. Yeah, I, 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 this, this would be a major bill. It'd be great if it could be a bipartisan bill um, that I worked on, just as these two did in 2000, 
What was that? 1998. All right. So. 1998. <laughs> uh, but I know I understand. I mean, we we don't really have time to do that. Um, I, I don't know. I just it just seems like we're going to do a bill. The bill may be. It's up to the committee. You know how we're all in a rush. Uh, you know what our bills. Three months we have to work on a bill, uh, and that. You know, but if it's a first term bill, then then there's the bill can be retained and continue to be worked on. Uh, I would imagine that way, um, assuming that that we can't get agreement. And I, you know, but anyway, that's just my thoughts. That's all. If I, if I may just add one thing, to, uh, there is uh, actually as today at ten thirty, uh, the education committee is coming into a meeting to uh, to. Um, do its work on an interim study of House Bill 1680, which is uh, a comprehend an effort to make a comprehensive reform of the uh, school funding system. Included in that bill, actually, is the uh, are the provisions of House Bill 504 as a subset of the larger bill, uh, and that's going to be discussed in detail at, uh, at this education committee meeting. Uh, so uh, there's this other aspect of it. It's a part of a much bigger picture and pa package. Absolutely. Thank you. Representative Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So my predecessor for Sullivan County District 7, uh, Representative uh, Jim Grenier, was on that education committee uh, that examined school funding back in uh, 2020 or before then, 2019. Um, and I wonder, so what happened with the results from that and the recommendations from that committee? Did anybody do anything with it? Do you know anybody? You know, I, I, I don't remember specifically. I think the worst, uh, for one thing, Representative Umberger didn't return um, in, in the next legislature. So she wasn't here to, you know, shepherd the results of the co commission. There were parts of it, I think, that made their way into uh, legislation. You could ask the education committee representatives who are here if you want a better answer than, than I can provide on that. But maybe that's a detour that the chair doesn't want to take. I don't know. Any further questions or comments? Uh, Representative Altney. Thank you. Um, this, what is what gets done is going to depend a lot on the speaker. Um, SciTech shaped the original agreement. On um, if and we don't, we won't know on um, what has to be done if they decide. It, not until the Supreme Court uh, makes a decision for us. And in the meantime, we could be doing one thing and the Supreme Court would decide it was still improper and that would take a number of years more to figure out. Uh, we had, it was not easy the first time. We, um, while we were meeting, they, put out the sales tax and the income tax bills that were on um, the income tax bill in particular would have solved this, but the governor as well as a lot of people in the state did not want it. Uh, and that one eventually uh, failed because of that. Um, and meanwhile, we were still working as I remember and we came up with something that got called the poo-poo plan, <laughs> a bit of all sorts of things. It took uh, eight hours of debate. I think it was after midnight when we finished, finally. Mm -hmm. uh, things got taken out, they got put back again. <laughs> um, and we finally passed that, and then over succeeding years, there were, was more work done on it. So um, we have to be prepared if the court actually produces a decision which doesn't say what you're doing is fine, <laughs> then on, on that it's not going to be one bill and quick. 
what I've heard here this morning is that a bill is really needed. Work really needs to be done. And I would certainly recommend that we want that we put forth let me see. so I read it right we have only two things we can do either not recommend for future legislation or recommend for future legislation and I think we can hey, may I make a motion no. is that an order oh uh, we're not in executive session what's that I was I was asking if I could make a motion, but we're not in an executive session, so we could move to go Roger into names uh, for for a motion uh, to go into executive session to consider. Executive session. Or you maybe you have to do that. You have to listen to executive session. Oh, <laughs> absolutely right. I'm, I'm getting old at this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Representative Ames. We will now go into executive session. And Representative Ames, do you have a motion? I recommend that this committee uh, um, vote to recommend this bill for future legislation. Is that the right way to put it? Uh, I second that motion. It's exactly. Yes, I, I second that. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded that, that this committee recommends uh, future. Let me see the wording on that. Recommends for future legislation. Any further discussion? If not, then we're going to call the vote. Any Thank questions? you, Mr. Chair. Uh, roll call vote. Roll call vote. We'll begin the voting on HB 504. The motion is to recommend for future legislation. We'll begin the voting with Representative Abrami. Yes. Representative Ulrey. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Aaron. Yes. Representative Janigian. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Tudor. Yes. Representative Almy. Representative Ames. Yes. Representative Southworth. Yes. Representative Malloy. Yes. The Honorable Representative Thomas C. Schomburg. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Yes. Thank you, sir. Representative Tucker. Yes. Representative Gomarlo. Yes. Representative Hacken Phillips. Yes. One, two, three, four, five. Representative. Oh, and the chair. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen to nothing. Vote being sixteen to zero. The motion passes. Well, yeah. um, any objections to put it on the consent calendar? No. Fine. No, I, I don't think there will be. No. What we do here is that. Okay. I think this needs to be a. Session. Right. Okay. I think there has to be a report. There has to yeah. be a report. It has to be a, a short report. Right. Uh, I think that's the, that's the issue. Okay. And we need to get that report out by the 28th of October. So, so do we leave it that I, I will uh, draft a report and send it to you? Yes. Yes. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay, the next bill is House Bill 1204-FN. That's an act reducing the rate of the meals and rooms tax and increasing the revenue sharing of meals and rooms tax revenue with municipalities. Do we have any questions or comments from anybody? Representative Brown. Like I said, I guess I'll start here. Um, you know, we've, we've reduced a lot of taxes over the last couple of years, and we're in the middle of reducing the uh, interest and dividends tax a percent every year going forward. Um, I don't think reducing the room and meals tax as prescribed here is a good idea. And then uh, I know they want to redirect, redirect more of the money to the municipalities, I guess, uh, which it would be, you know, a pretty sizable hit in our, in our revenues. Um, and I think when it comes to, you know, next year, we have to take a look at the big picture in terms of all our revenues. Um, and I, I don't think we want to start by us uh, suggesting that we want to reduce the meals and rooms tax. It's just my general comment. So I, I would be a no on this at this point. Further questions or comments? Representative Alney. Thank you. Um, I completely agree. I think that next year is a year for taking stock of what is going on and trying to figure out where we're going to start to be. Even by the end of, of this fiscal year we're in, never mind the next fiscal year, what it's going to look like before we make any more changes that cost us revenue at the state level. Right, and I, I agree with you, Representative Alamy. The uh, changes that we've already passed, some of them haven't been fully implemented, and they are in the process of being implemented this year, next year, and the following year, and the following year after that. One of the big things I worry about is that we and every other state is doing great right now with revenues. The primary reason for that is all the stimulus checks that went to all the individuals, uh, the opera money that went out, the PPP money, that all stimulated business and brought in revenue that we hadn't anticipated. And that's going to, the result of that's going to be going away. And we need to wait and see what that settles down to. Because that's going to be settling now at the same time as we're continuing to ink, to reduce our tax revenues. Any further questions or comments? I'll follow up with that. Representative Brown. So yeah, I mean, the opera money is still being spent. I mean, it's, some of our, I know some of our state opera, opera money hasn't even been obligated yet. Right. It may, I guess, but it's, there's money that's still going out the door. I know the county in Rockingham, we got six, we got 60 million. And uh, a lot of that's going to go to a, a new building for uh, some outpatient services and things like that. And, and housing some of our agencies, but um, but, but all that money hasn't been spent either. So, um, I mean, that, that's, uh, yeah. And, and Representative uh, Major is correct. Uh, you know, we, we don't stand alone. When I talk to people, legislators from other states, they're all saying that they're all washing money too. So there's something's up here that something is going to eventually, we, we, I know for the last two years, we've all been waiting for the shoot, the shoe to drop at <laughs> the other shoe to drop. And we haven't gotten there yet, but I think we just have to be cautious. It's coming. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Representative Janijin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to also say that I, I agree that we should 
not move this forward. Um, it's each each tax and some of the taxes that we've reduced. Um, definitely, we've seen you know for example the business profits tax. We, we've seen over time even prior to the COVID pandemic that <laughs> lowering it. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, I was just saying, so we have seen that some of the other taxes we've reduced, like the business profits tax, and I'm talking even before COVID, did have an increase in business activity. Um, this, this, I'm not sure how, given the, con I agree with the concerns that we don't know how much things are going to be affected. I don't see this reducing this tax as being, a, you know, major driver um, of of new business right now. So I think it's probably better, given the given the amounts here, to leave this as it is. Any further questions or comments, uh, Representative Spilsbury? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thought when we reviewed this uh, bill that it sort of represented an internal conflict or at least a choice. On the one hand, it proposes to reduce the rate, and on the other hand, it proposes to share more of what's collected. And uh, the idea of uh, increasing the share to the municipalities is very attractive to me. If we found ourselves in a future legislature where the circumstances and the revenue supported that, decision, I think I would be in favor of it, but I probably wouldn't be reducing the rate in the same bill. Representative Almey, followed by Representative Brown. Thank you. Uh, we have to be very careful when we're looking at what our tax reduction on on policy was that we look also at the economic activity that was producing the surge in revenues. They don't match up. Um, if you, um, we have that from the DRA now that they've got excellent analysts and they've got very good uh, data collection for which we didn't have. 10, 15 years ago. Um, the, we don't have any idea yet what the change to single sales factor is going to do to our business tax. It could be nothing. It could be drastic. And we won't know until anything until 2024 about that, I think. There, there will be some small indication maybe from analyzing what market-based sourcing did next year. <laughs> but um, that gives me the willies. The credit carry forward gives our chair the willies, <laughs> uh, which is huge and can be asked for back. And we also, we've been assuming that there would be more refunds this year than there have been uh, from the PPP. And um, I think the refunds are up a little, but not much uh, so far. Um, it's, I described the credit carry forward situation to a uh, very good accountant, and she kind of went white. <laughs> but. Uh, so we really, uh, and we have the Fed on uh, almost certainly triggering off that recession that hadn't come yet uh, by continuing to raise rates to make sure that we don't get into the kind of runaway inflation that I have experienced twice in, in my life, as, uh, once in Brazil and once here when I was a young professional. Uh, and on, uh, so they need, Fed needs to do what it needs to do, but it's on, um, we're not, we don't have any good choices on that. So, and we don't know, I think one of the things this committee can do next year is to try to get 
information from LBAO on on the finance side of these things. What on what sectors of industry in this state have been most affected by the stimulus that's gone out? And what's happening to them to the extent that we can? And that may help with what Representative Abrami has been was talking about about there's still ARPA money going out and some other money and there's still the uh, IRA going out and there's still uh, the transportation money going out. Um, it's in specific defined sectors and we don't even know what most of the sectors are at this point because it's all being the ARPA money is all coming through the governor and the fiscal committee. Representative Romney. Yeah, if I make a recollection, the 30% that we're at now, um, sorry. Yeah, the 30% we're at now was an HB2, HB2, correct? Yeah. And that was because it was sitting around 21, 22% before that, correct? Yeah. So, was it 22 before? So, so at least for the, for, this budget year, at least this this budget cycle, it will probably retain that it, it, it was an increase to thirty percent, and then moving to forty. I know that was the original target, right, going way back, yeah. but we never got there because every every budget finance committee, they always chop it down when we're looking for revenues. So, you know, I don't know if we'll ever get to the forty percent. You know what I mean? Because it's one of those things in that. We we can say anything we want in a bill, but when HB two comes along, that can change uh, when they're looking for money. So, um, but at the very least, for this budget for this budget that we're in, we know that it's gone up, well maybe eight percent to thirty percent for the towns. Thank you. And that hasn't settled in yet, so that that will be happening. Um, Representative Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I've heard some ideas floated around. Uh, first, first of all, a question about uh, funds that are collected from this. How much of it goes to our travel and tourism uh, agency or department in the state? Is there a portion of this that is allocated, or is that just done through the budget, the state budget process? I, I can't hear you. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. Kane, do you have anything to add to that? Okay. So follow up. Something on there is money allocated each year for the advertising budget. It used to be very small. We increased it uh, in 2007 on and ever since then until we hit this very sharp recession with COVID on on rooms and meals has been going up about 5% a year, which I thought and we all thought and finance thought was a very good return on investment. Uh, it was reduced a lot in 11, 12, but I think just for one year, and then they put it back up again. So Follow-up question? Rob's an hour. The reason I'm asking is because there was someone who suggested to me uh, that they wanted to take a some portion of what we collect in rooms and meals tax. And it, I know that the, the travel and tourism department does mostly marketing stuff, but there's no real development happening for tourism in any of our counties. And except I know in Sullivan County, we have a Sugar River Development Council that is uh, working on developing tourism in in our in our in our county and so they're looking for ways in which to fund that effort 
and and so I, I don't know if you've heard of any kind of other uh, initiatives that are trying to tap into rooms and meals tax. I, I'm not sure, but that would be a question for the appropriators and the finance committee. Can okay. they make the decision, decision right. on that? Oh. Okay. Representative Gamalo. There, there is actually a fairly large initiative being put on by Taylor Caswell's development um, agency, whose new name I never can remember, the former Dread, right. now, now two agencies. And there is actually a statewide initiative. The um, Executive Council has approved a contract with an agency that's outside group that's been employed to see what we can do to broaden and strengthen <clears throat> our outdoor recreation in the state of New Hampshire. And it's uh, just getting off the ground uh, and it's going to be much more regularized, standardized and expanded. Mm. So I think we all need to keep an eye on that. Some people want to keep things quite local. Others are keen to make it more statewide. I think that's being decided in the next year or two. Taylor Caswell's taken an initiative in this area. It's backed by the governor and many uh, groups like Appalachian Mountain Club, trails groups, very enthusiastic about mm -hmm. broadening, bicycling, kayaking, mm -hmm. all kinds of mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is the executive is doing their job. I think they really are getting, uh, yes, and uh, I think to tie it to rooms and meals may not be in the best interest of sort of a slope of activity going upward, right? because it would be affected by sort of the fits and starts of, of uh, a particular year of tourism, and I think they're trying to get away from that. Right. That's my understanding. I haven't had a briefing on the topic. It's only from what I've read. Uh, I agree with you. And uh, we don't divvy up the pie. We just create the revenue source. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Then do I hear a motion? Go into executive session first. Um, yes, we need to go into executive session. I guess we're still in it, but that's all right. We have to yeah, we never motion. went out. All right, why don't we do okay. I'll, I'll make the motion. Representative Romney. I'll make the motion uh, uh, that, uh, well, let me, let me use the right words here. What are the words? Not recommend. That we don't recommend this for future legislation. Second. Okay, the motion made by Representative Romney not to recommend for future legislation Seconded by Representative Almy. Any comments or questions? Okay, we've had enough discussion, so I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. House Bill 1204, the motion is to not recommend for future legislation. We'll begin the voting with Representative Abrami. Yes. Representative Ulrey. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Aaron. Yes. Representative Janigian. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Tudor. Yes. Representative Almy. Yes. Representative Ames. Yes. Representative Southworth. Yes. Representative Malloy. Yes. The Honorable Thomas C. Schomburg. Yes. <laughs> Representative Tucker. Yes. Representative Gomarlo. Representative Hacken Phillips. Yes. 16 to nothing. I'm sorry. Chairman Major. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> the vote being 16 to nothing, the motion of not recommending passes. And can I put down Representative Abrami to write the committee yeah. report? Okay. 
then told me that <laughs> just as if it was someone to know if I had made it or not. I, I went into Karen and asked, and they said they've had problems with it. Yeah. And we just shut it off. No. no. To quote a former president, wear a cardigan sweater. <laughs> I agree, it is getting very cold. Okay, our next bill is House Bill 1500-FN-A, an act reducing the rate of the communication service tax and repealing the tax in 2025. And this repeals the tax in increments of uh, 2% until it disappears in 25. Representative Yearly. Representative uh, uh, Major, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, the qu question that should always be on this particular tax, this is more of a user fee than a tax. It's not really a, uh, it's called a communications tax, but if I'm not mistaken, the monies go almost exclusively to operating the E911 uh, system. So if future legislation is goes forward, the amount of this fee should likely be tied to the cost to operate. Am I saying that correctly? There was, I believe that the 911 was a additional fee put on top of the regular fee so that the bulk of it does not go to 911 but 911 is serviced by it well if this is just a tax tax to raise money then who cares but if the money is tied directly to a usage or a service provided by the state, that's entirely different. And whichever way the vote comes out of committee today, that distinction should be made. So if, uh, regardless of how we're gonna do it, that, that should be done. Right, part of this money raise goes to 911. Reps and Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, looking back at my notes, I saw that one of the reasons we had put this off was because we could not figure out the impact of this tax, given that uh, landline, still not close enough, <laughs> given that landline uh, communication uh, was decreasing, and we brought up the question about uh, products such as Zoom that use, um, and, and the like that use uh, communication services. Uh, but one of the major reasons we didn't move forward was because we we didn't couldn't really identify the size of this um, decrease. So I mean I think to move ahead with something where we can't really identify this needs this needs more study. Um, I probably would recommend that we not move forward with this at this point. And if uh, you know more research is done and we get more information on it, this could be brought. Uh, back again. Thank you, uh, Representative Almy, and and followed by Representative Hacken Phillips. Thank you. Um, I this is not do, this does not go to the E nine one one system, except that it goes to the general fund, and maybe the general fund helps uh, with this one. On um, this, but this is, it used to be a major tax when all we had was landlines on, and when on the communications companies couldn't play games with how much was being taxed on, we on got ungrand, we got ungrandfathered two years before the feds ungrandfathered everybody 
on this and we can't use it for internet stuff. If you spend a lot of time going down through your phone bill, you may discover that on you are paying maybe a dollar a month in this tax at the most. On um, they they really on um, have set it so that it when you are making a phone call phone calls, the same number of phone calls I used to make on my landline, I'm making them on my cell phone and my landline, and the bills are are paying, doing, the, I think it's 7% on uh, a very much smaller uh, number, uh, amount of my activity that is what, that is on uh, not internet, uh, except that it's going over the internet now. Everything is going over the internet. So um, it's shrunk to a, around 32 at, the, at this point, million? 39.6. 39.6, that was the uh, revenue for 21. Right. We were still getting 39.6 out of it, but it's going down every year. Uh, but 39.6 million pays for 39.6 million worth of programs that the state does for the businesses, the com communities, and the households. And every time we cut revenues, those programs get cut too. The money has to come from somewhere. And they end up in the hands of the municipalities. And the municipalities cannot do those particular programs as efficiently as, as the state can. So we are increasing the tax burden on the citizens and saying that we decreased it. This is true across our tax system at this point. The property taxes keep going up and the uh, state taxes either stay the same or or they go up in in our case in spurts a year or two after after the the tax was changed and uh we really until we totally reform the tax system, which I think won't happen in my lifetime. We've got, we've got to recognize this. We've got to deal with this. When we are cutting further into our revenues um, in a good time, when we get to the bad time, things fall apart. On, I've got social service agencies that didn't get paid for six months all of a sudden. And had to depend on local donations to try to stay open for senior citizens and open and and the county taxes had to go up to pay for more in the nursing homes on uh, that's been going on since 20 I, the long, whole time I've been there <laughs> but, this is associated with the communication tax. yes it is on um, I I think that any recommending any uh, tax reduction to go forward in the next term when we haven't figured out what's going on is on uh, is not in the interests of, of the state. Representative Hacken Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to follow off those last sets of comments um, is it's my sense that the reasoning that we we're not suggesting legislation moved forward on HB 1204 also applies to HB 1500 and that, you know, I would urge caution for us to be able to assess recent reductions in tax revenues um, in the coming months so that we can get a better grasp of what's going on before we make another, you know, potential reduction of 39 million plus million dollars. So, um, you know, it's my it's my thought that you know if we're going to be intellectually honest, that we should continue to 
um, remember the comments we made just a few moments ago and to um, to apply that to HB 500, uh, 1500 as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> Any further? Uh, Representative Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, so my, my thought is similar. I'd, I'd like to just know before we start cutting any kind of um, revenue like this, that we have a good understanding of what this funds and how that would affect them uh, should we cut this. So I think, I, I don't know that we as a committee have a full understanding of uh, what what the thirty nine point six million dollars is going towards, and if if it has um, value or they're good programs, I don't know. Representative Bronny. Well, to answer that question, I I don't think the these funds are really earmarked for a specific thing. I think they want it in the general fund, and and. You know, it's up to finance how they they spend that money. But we could find out how many how many, if there's anything related to telecom, that's that general fund money is being used for. So, uh, same same arguments as before, as the last bill. We don't know. And 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 note in the in the bill, sorry. Would Representative Harker and Phillips want to make the motion? I wanted to make a comment. Okay, Representative Tucker. Uh, one of the things that I think is um, one of the things that I think is true about New Hampshire is that we have a large number of revenue sources, unlike most states, which are quite dependent on a very few revenue sources. And over time, this has allowed for a stability for New Hampshire that has not been true of That's some bad. other states. So before we cut out all these little uh, sources of revenue, I think we need to have a better appreciation of how New Hampshire has managed to live without sales and income tax. And it has to do with a broad number. And we've added to it with charitable gaming, sports betting. You know, we've done uh, some things that have brought in revenues uh, as other things have fallen, but we have kept a large number of revenue sources. And I think that probably that's where the committee should start next uh, year in the orientation is getting a better, more formal grasp of what, of that truth that more revenue sources. It isn't added revenues, it's the number of sources is a real plus for this state. Okay. Before I go, Hark uh, Representative Hacken Phillips, I apologize for cutting <laughs> Representative Bronny off. Uh, Representative Bronny. Yeah, the chair thought I was making a motion. I don't know. I was, I didn't know. No, 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 no. He thought I was making a motion. I, no, I was, I was just uh, commenting. You, you know, Representative uh, Tucker, yeah, absolutely right. That we've had these these all these different taxes, little ones, that have really helped us in the in, in downturns. Maybe the biz, maybe business taxes have declined, but other ones have stayed stayed fine, and that that's helped us out of recessions over the time because our recessions seem to be less. We have a, a smaller trough. Right, right, right. We kind of smoothed it with all these smaller taxes. So. And I, again, for the reasons I stated in the prior bill, I, I don't think uh, we need to to get rid of this tax. It's already kind of baked into everybody's phone bills. No one, probably most people, didn't realize it's there. And uh, and um, and I understand that the the analysis done by uh, <clears throat> the DRA was a static analysis for just the reasons we talked about because they didn't know they don't know because this this. This is a tax that's in transition. And as we, in terms of, of the different products that are being taxed and not taxed, so I, get, I think even the DRA is trying to get a handle on that as to whether the, what we're gonna tax is going up or whatever, what we're gonna tax is going down. So, but anyway, I, 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 would, I, would, I don't wanna make the motion, but I'll, I'll support a no motion if someone makes that. Before we go to the motion, Representative Hacken Phillips, Representative Bernstein. 
Yeah, I just I think it's important to um, at least cite the other side of the argument. The the sponsor of the bill um, said that this would save New Hampshire families about three to five dollars a month. He also pointed out that this is as regressive of a tax as you can get. It it's not dependent on your income. It's dependent on your cell phone bill, which is pretty much a necessity now. So it's extremely regressive. And then, look, we all understand that the revenue from this tax continues to go down as landlines are used less and less. There's a cost to collecting the tax. And as the revenue drops, we're just not getting as good of a bang for our buck as we were in previous years. So if, if you are going to cut taxes, this would be a good one. One final point where meals and rooms tax, um, or business profits tax, sometimes benefits non-residents of New Hampshire, a reduction of this tax or an elimination of this tax would be to the sole benefit of New Hampshire residents and taxpayers. And I think, um, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of the arguments from the other side. I just think it's important to highlight the other position. That's it, thanks. Representative Alamy. Thank you. I just wanted to clear something up for Representative Aaron. The Finance Committee, just as, as we don't appropriate money, the Finance Committee doesn't designate money for specific places unless they create a dedicated fund. If they create a dedicated fund, it is no longer in the regular budget. Um, so on that, on that, 39.7 million went to into a general pool and cannot be determined as to what it's paying for. But we can look at the general pool and say that it is getting bigger or it is getting smaller. And when it is getting smaller, then um, the departments after it's frequently the departments that have to decide what they're cutting out of their budgets and what they're delaying paying for and sometimes never paying for um, when we run into a recessionary period. And because it's past the budget time when we realize that there aren't enough revenues. And so the department, commi the commissioners who are appointed for four to six, four to five years each are the ones who make that decision. And they may or may not be influenced by the governor. If it's a good governor, the governor is helping them make it. Representative Hacken Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are we in executive session now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to make a motion that this committee not recommend HB 1500 for future legislation. Recom um, Representative Hacken Phillips made the motion not to recommend. Do we have a second? I'll well, second it. Re seconded by Representative Brown. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The bill is House Bill 1500. The motion is to not recommend this bill for future legislation. We'll begin the voting with Representative Abrami. Yes. Representative Ullery. No. The clerk votes no. Representative Aaron. No. Representative Janigian. Yes. Representative Spillsbury. Yes. Representative Tudor. Yes. Representative Almy. Yes. Representative Ames. Yes. Representative Southworth. Yes. Representative Malloy. Yes. The Honorable Representative Thomas C. Schomburg. Your voice is so calming. Yes. <laughs> Representative Tucker. Yes. Representative Gomarlo. <clears throat> Representative Hacken Phillips. Yes. Chairman Major. Yes. The motion carries 13 to 3. The motion was voted 13 to 3. It passes.
Representative Hacken Phillips, can I note you as the author of the report? Thank you. The next bill is House Bill 1525-FN-A, establishing a county nursing home capital reserve fund. Questions or comments? Uh, Representative Aaron. Well, since this was my bill, I'd like to speak to it. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Originally, I, I was seeking to have a state fund established, a capital reserve fund to help our counties deal with some of the escalating costs of renovating or rebuilding their county nursing home facilities as a result of federal guidelines that have affected the cost of building these uh, or doing renovations. I know that um, now, the um, Federal Guidelines Institute, the FGI, which dictates how much space you need per resident and other space requirements within a facility, are they are going to private rooms only for our for our uh, nursing home facilities, as opposed to you know allowing semi-private rooms or uh, three people to a room. So that, that um, is a huge cost for our counties when they're doing these renovations and, and rebuilds. So um, I think it might be a good idea to, to keep an eye on um, what's happening with some of the costs for our counties with regard to the uh, renovating their facilities. I know for the time being, a um, a fund has been set up that has been funded with ARPA money through the Gopher uh, agency. And right now, counties can apply for some ARPA, extra ARPA and uh, funding for them to do that. For example, Sullivan County is uh, requesting some funds from this fund that was established. And the fund was established with $50 million. Um, but this is a short term kind of solution because it's with ARPA funds and it is um, not going to be there forever. So it, it might be worth looking at um, establishing some sort of um, county capital reserve fund at the state level at some point because as our counties continue to want to renovate and update their facilities, they are gonna need some help to do it. It's just becoming way too cost prohibitive uh, to rely on just their taxpayers for their counties. And that's all I wanted to say. Additional questions or comments? Representative Southworth. Uh, thank you. I don't have really an issue with going forward as she said in studying this, because I do think in some areas that may reach actually a crisis level, you know, as we go on. So we might as well start looking at it now. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Am I, am I hearing that? Representative Romney. Mr. Chair, uh, so would the recommendation be to continue to come up with a bill to continue to study this issue versus this bill? is what I'm trying to understand. If we would say yes to this, would it be more to study the approach? Because again, it comes back to the same old problem. You know, there are 10 counties, who gets the money? Many, many counties have already paid for new or renovated nursing homes already. Um, all politics is local. Um, so I, I wouldn't mind if, if you said, yeah, we'll make, you know, in the blurb it said that that if you made the motion, yes, if you said that to continue to study would be one thing, but I don't know if I'd, you know, we'd be, be back in the same place next year if it was the same bill, I think. That's my opinion. 
motion that we can have is one of two. Okay. To recommend for future legisl legislation or not recommend. And it doesn't say what's in it. Yeah. Representative Alamy. Thank you. Um, I agree in many ways with Representative Abrami. Um, we added a new wing and rehabilitated everything else um, about 15 years ago. I think we finished. Uh, and we cut the budget too low and then had to add more money later on to pay for it because we'd been taken, the feds had, had find us. <laughs> but on, I think one thing we have to do as a state is to go after that board along with all the other states and get them to understand that it's going to be really difficult to afford uh, the baby booners going through the nursing homes if we're doing it in single room occupancy. Uh, but uh, for this one, I think that if we, we, the one thing we could do is not recommended and in the blurb say, but a study committee would be advised. Let me remind you this. Whatever we do here, either recommend or not recommend, they can still do what they want to do. <laughs> so, <What? laughs> Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, over here. <laughs> Reps and Ames. Yeah. I, you know, I actually, I'm okay if it says recommend for future legislation or recommend against. Um, I, I'm perfectly happy to be for future legislation with a blurb that makes it clear that what we're we're for is a, is a study of da da da, um, and that's good enough for me. And it uh, it it essentially says there's a problem here that needs to be addressed, but we don't know exactly what it is and. It's essentially sending the message that what we have in front of us isn't quite right. So that sort of addresses the no side of this discussion, but it uh, it uh, says we got to deal with this, and that's the positive. So, Representative Aaron, you've heard the discussion. But, uh, before we go back to you, Representative Uli. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, one thing that hasn't been uh, remarked on is that unlike the municipalities, counties have their own existence se separate from the state. They they exist separate from the state. As a matter of fact, many people would say they pre-exist the state. Therefore, each county can do what it wants under our Constitution. Towns and cities can't. The county can each of the other counties has taken their own act, uh, actions regarding a wide variety of cases from stopping to maintaining, uh, quote, county roads to um, establishing a nursing home to maintaining or not maintaining, uh, at least in two situations, uh, county jails. It's up to the county, which has its own existence, to deal with that separate from the state. Now, whether the state should get involved in the counties, thus decreasing the authority of the counties. I know there was some legislation in the past to re uh, remove the counties, which would have required a constitutional amendment. But um, that do we? The, the question is, do we want the counties to be counties? Or do we want this to be one big state? 1.7 million people it takes three hours to get from one side of the town to the other. Of course, Los Angeles has got more, and it takes the same amount of time, but that's... Representative Aaron. Yes, and one thing, thank you for that. Uh, and, and one thing I do want to add is that our counties are not statutorily obligated to have nursing home facilities. So, I mean, there's that. Um, but... The, the fact of the matter is the counties are still charged by the state 
money uh, for, to take care of their citizens and money is going back from the counties to the state mm -hmm. to do that. Um, so we do have a, 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 a um, you know, a, a situation where we are we are beholden to the state for for funds, you know, that we have to give the state funds. Um, but by the same token, in providing these medical services for our um, low income seniors and and people who need them, uh, it's becoming that much more expensive for our counties to do this based on outside so you know outside uh, things that we have no control over and that's a problem and i think it that's something that at least we have to keep an eye on and and possibly study and take a seat take a look and see uh, how that's affecting everything so, so if you make a motion for, for the rec recommendation and in the blurb uh, talk about study I'd be happy to. Any further questions or comments? Uh, Representative Alme, I mean, we are. So I'd make a motion, to, motion. To, uh, the, to, um, a motion to to study the to. I'd recommend this for future study. For future legislation. For future legislation and, to study and the then issue. You're explaining your blurb. Mm -hmm. I'll second that, Mr. Chairman. And seconded by Representative Schreinberg. Any further discussion or comments? Then, saying none, if the clerk could call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's House Bill 1525. The motion is to recommend for future legislation. We'll begin the voting with Representative Abrami. Yes. Representative Omari. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Aaron? Yes. Representative Janigian? Yes. Representative Spilsbury? Yes. Representative Tudor? Yes. Representative Almy? Yes. Representative Ames? Yes. Representative Southworth? Yes. Representative Malloy? Yes. The Honorable Representative Thomas C. Schomburg? Since this is your last roll call, Mr. Clerk, I'd like to. No, there's, there's one no. more. I'll save my. Uh, uh, affection for you for that one. Yes. <laughs> Representative Tucker. Yes. Representative Gomarlo. Representative Hacken Phillips. Yes. Chairman Major. Yes. Are we missing one? Did I get everyone? 16 to nothing. Oh, okay. I missed it. Since the vote being 16 to nothing, the motion of recommended for future legislation passes. Represent Aaron will provide the vote. Now we are at our last bill. Re uh, House Bill 1565-FN relative to the Opioid Abatement Trust Fund. Representative Southwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so this is one that I followed closely uh, in my career. Uh, I was very aware of the crisis and, uh, you know, the broad effects. Um, I was uh, interested in reading the rules, um, but I found they didn't have some of the details that I would like. There basically will be competitive grant programs for the funds uh, at the county and municipal level one of my issues with grants that are competitive is some counties are much better at writing grants and dotting I's and crossing T's and the same with municipalities. So I'm just hoping the people overseeing the grants recognize that with the opioid crisis, there are areas of the state with greater need than others. And those may not be the same match as the people who are the best at writing grants. And so I do really think uh, there has to be this overview I also think they should make some of it uh, as easy as they can. For example, most communities uh, need help affording the cost of Narcan. So I'd like to see some type of rule where, you know, it's relatively easy to document your usage of Narcan and get reimbursed and so on. Um, again, so it's very even 
in, in terms of the disbursement. Um, to me, this program is, I mean, the problem is gigantic, and I still think sometimes people don't quite grab onto it. Um, in our county, uh, we have a diversion program, and we have individuals, uh, you know, that are working. Uh, can't even decide what word you'd use, but, you know, they are addicts, and they are working very hard. Um, but when we have what sometimes are graduation ceremonies, they have a lawyer, family members, a social worker, one or two doctors, a court system person. There, there are seven to ten people for each case, uh, and then they may relapse. So I think, uh, and I also didn't mention uh, probably someone from their business, uh, their boss or someone who uh, is supporting them from their business. So it really, uh, it's very large. Uh, and I don't, you know, what I'm hearing so far, I'm not sure we even yet know the best way really to address it. We have different programs that work, but I'm not at all sure um, we have the big picture uh, of how to address it. Um, so again, I, you know, I think it will really depend on helping people writing the right grants, having overviews, uh, all those kinds of things. I just see it as quite complicated. Um, and I don't see, based on this bill, that we can really make a change right now because the funds are just beginning to come in. They're just beginning to disperse them. So it seems to me, um, really, we aren't even there yet as far as deciding we need to change something about the approach. Uh, and the only other thing I'd add is, um, you know, for people who haven't had the experience, uh, if you do know someone who's been through this, and uh, you know, has used fentanyl when they're taking care of the young children and died there with them. Um, you know, this is what's happening all around the state still. Oh, thank you. So my recommendation is that we not move forward at this time. <clears throat> Representative Spillsbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I concur. Uh, it just seems to me that the specific ways and means context of allocating funds has become moot. The program's sailing ahead, and I'm sure oversight and review from the appropriate committee will be in order for the next legislature, but I don't see the role of this committee in the coming legislature. Representative Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just a reminder of um, the, the um, intent of this bill to begin with was to alter the allocation formula so that counties were not being um, given a, a, a penalty based on population. And um, because their programs are different than the programs that municipalities might have established um, and so if you had, say, Sullivan County um, getting penalized for uh, Claremont, the population of Claremont being taken out of their amount, a pot of money, that it wasn't, this, this bill sought to fix that. Um, some people saw that as double counting. I don't see it as double counting. But in any case, I mean, the, the allocation formula that we currently have was something that was put together by a, uh, a judge from another state. And there have been states who have already altered their allocation formulas uh, away from what that judge had decided. Um, I, I guess there's some wisdom in, in looking to see uh, where everything shakes out when funds start flowing and money gets allocated out. But by the same token, I think that there's going to be this mentality afterwards that's going to say, oh, well, we can't change it now because we've already started allocating money. And, and I think that's unfortunate because we will lose the opportunity to kind of fine tune it and get it right in terms of how we allocate the funds coming in from these opioid settlements. So that's all I have to say about this bill. I, again, would like to see some more, for us to, to, to see some reports and see how money is being allocated 
especially with the grants that are being set up. Um, and I'd, I'd like to see how effective these out the current allocation is as opposed to what we could have in the future. So I'd like to keep an eye on it and maybe study it in the future sometime too. Representative Brown. Okay, so so the way it's set up now is the 23 original political subdivisions that have filed lawsuits. And I would assume Sullivan County was one of those divisions. Yes. Correct. All the counties, I think, were. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know we spent a lot of time on this bill. And we heard from the AG, I forget his name now. Perfetti. Perfetti from the AG's office who uh, basically put the, I guess, the words around uh, our our procedure, if you will, that we're using. And the, and the, and the fund, there, there is another committee, or I don't know what you want to call it, a, a, a trust fund committee that's making these decisions about these grant requests come in and then we have to approve them. So that's all in place. Uh, and I know we just had another settlement, right? J&J? Was it J&J? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 40 yeah. something. Million. 40 something, million, right? So, so I don't even know where, yeah, I, I agree with you one, uh, one thing, Representative, is that yes, we, we need to keep an eye on this to see I think the question is you're bringing up is fairness. Will will the will the grants be allocated in a fair way, and will the counties be be treated? You know, not. I know right now the allocation of the 15 percent goes based on pop population, correct? So, in your small county, so I understand your your concern, and your problem may be bigger than just mm -hmm. the you know. Probably be disproportionate to your population, I guess mm -hmm. is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but at this point, I think it's a matter of of us as a committee keeping an eye on this. And I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend future recommend uh, legislation, but maybe some kind of an oversight as to uh, maybe periodically calling in the uh, the folks overseeing this fund to see if, you know, I'm not going to say I'm not going to I'm not saying that they're not going to be fair. But it'd be interesting to see how the money is being allocated um, to the various communities. So I'm all set. Thank you. And so I'll be I'll be supporting a no motion. Representative Alvey. Thank you. Um, I think I agree with uh, Representative Spilsbury that this is something that the Health and Human Services Committee should be evaluating. Uh, as we go forward, we've been kind of had had a difficulty with this, partly because um, the the committee that was formed to to deal with this, which is uh, led by uh, Senator Rosenwald, um, does come more from that side of things, and is um, has named the AAG Buffetti as uh, as their sole spokesperson on this, which um, I tried to get Senator Rosenwald to come and talk to us too about what they were planning on doing, because a number of the questions, especially about uh, help for the communities that don't know how to write grants very well, on um, was on and the Narcan program were on mentioned as things they were trying to get through in the rule that, that they couldn't do until the rules had gotten through jail car. I think the rules got through jail car recently, very recently, um, but we don't know what the results of that will be. But on um, what Senator Rosenwald said was was we don't know what we're doing until the rules have allowed us to meet and make those votes, which I don't know if that's happened yet. But um, I do think that that unless that those initiatives uh, don't work out, that uh, in practice, I think that the the Health and Human Services Committee is the one that can evaluate that better than, than 
we can. And actually that this bill is more about, well, it was about a dedicated fund and that's how it landed here, I think. Mm -hmm. But it was, was, was about essentially about where you appropriate the money. And that's a finance question and a health and human services question because that's the department that does it. So, uh, I'm, I'm for a no vote at this point, but if things don't work out, then later on. You got a better sense of this bill when you look at the methodology that's printed. <clears throat> and uh, you read that and may it would put me on the no path. Anything else? I'm just briefly, Mr. Chair. Representative Yuli. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> it just occurred to me that the paperwork that uh, was handed out at the beginning by Representative Ames in 504, particularly the uh, equitable and proportional case came out. If that case is decided saying that the distribution has to be equitable and proportional, the ramifications of that would then be that regardless of what formula was done for any distribution of funds received from any source, would therefore have to be equitable and proportional. So that what was being attempted by this bill couldn't happen because it wouldn't be equitable and proportional. It would be beneficial to one county over another because of population and or size. So there's a lot of uh, factors that go into this beyond what was attempted, but I think I've raised other questions that Representative Almy wants to comment on. Representative Almy. Well, one of the lawyers might be better at this, but on the reason that the courts opine on the education side is that they created on from the language in the Constitution, which is pretty clear, they established that uh, we owe everybody an adequate education. And I don't think we've owed decided we owe everybody adequate health access yet. Well, hopefully not ever, but uh, uh, I'd not be in favor of that one, but I, <laughs> that's yours. No, no problem. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further discussion? And do I hear a motion? I don't want to run a second door, but I guess I'll make a motion. <laughs> um, I move that no further legislation needed on this bill. Not recommended for further legislation. Thank you. Any second? Second. Okay, Representative Bromney moved, seconded by Representative Alamy, and recommended no further legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. House Bill 1565, the motion is to not recommend this for future legislation. We'll begin the voting with Representative Abrami. Yes. Representative Ulrey. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative Aaron. Yes. Representative Janigian. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Tudor. Yes. Representative Almy. Yes. Representative Ames. Yes. Representative Southworth. Yes. Representative Malloy. <clears throat> yes. And it saddens me to say these words for the final time, but the Honorable Representative Thomas C. Schomburg. Uh, Mr. Clerk, before I cast my vote, I'd like to thank you for your two years of respecting and the way you addressed all the representatives with their title and the chair. Uh, some committees don't do that, so. I appreciate, even though you had the word honorable to our mind, everyone here is very honorable. So uh, my vote is, would you vote Representative Brami? Yes, I vote yes. 
Thank you, Representative. Representative Tucker. Yes. yes. Representative Go Marlow. Yes. Representative Hacken Phillips. Yes. Representative Chairman Chairman Major. Yes. Sixteen love. The vote being sixteen to zero, the motion passes. Not further recommended. Um that finishes our work on bills. I have a note here. Anybody that's not returning, if they would clean out their drawers there in the committee room. And I want to thank everybody for acting civilly in our committee. And I think we have the most bipartisan committee there is. And what pleased me the most is that when we came, when we did the revenues, how we did it, and then both Representative Almy and I could stand up together and present him to the full house. And that really shows how we work together. We don't, I mean, we can be Republicans, we can be Democrats, and we can vote our principles, but we can still respect each other. And we have done that. And so what more can somebody ask for? So I hope everybody has a good rest of the year. Uh, I know I have a couple more dedicated fund committees to go to. I'm going to miss this. <laughs> and uh, it's been a pleasure working with all of you. Thank you. So, what are you so, going to give for a speech at the party? Yeah, we're right. <laughs> I have a few things. Yeah, so yes, if at the party we're gonna we're gonna spend uh, I guess after we eat, we're gonna have a time to talk about Norm, your chance to say your comments about Norm. Um, then we're gonna spend a little time uh, remembering Mary as well. And then uh, remembering all those that we know members here that have already said they're not going to run again or running for the Senate. And we want to give you a chance to say your goodbyes if you'd like. Okay. So that's what, that's what we haven't planned for later. Well, you probably could start getting there. You can probably start getting there by a quarter to, uh, and it'd take about 10 minutes. It's if you basically go down North North Main Street and keep on going under the highway, Great and it's it, 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 the it, 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 yeah, keep going to Main Street and it changes under after you come out underneath the the highway there, the under ninety three, it changes its name to Manchester Street from North. Street. And it's on the right. It's, it'll be on the right once you get down there. Huh? I don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> you, you're right. You pass Common Man, you go under the innocent. Last time. Thank you. So you're going to stay. Yeah, I'm going to stay. I don't think they will. Well, we didn't have enough votes against me on the Republican side. I don't know who voted for me and who voted against me on the Republican side, but there were 20. 27 write-ins. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Wow. And a lot of them were in the ward where I uh, canvassed for my new 